While Atari was enjoying the success of its arcade games and of the 2600 releasing a slew of new games like basketball or an imperfect home version of Space War, the competition came knocking and tore down the door, the floor, the building, and half the city. After a year of work in 1978, a man named Tomohiro Nishikado had created a landmark title at the company he was working for, Taito, a game that made Pong seem like yesterday's news and ushered in a new age of gaming. That game was Space Invaders. Today it may seem like it has a simple concept, you have a ship, you have shields, you shoot things coming at you but there was a lot to it compared to the previous generation of video games. It had, for example, a score system tied into a life system. It had more of a point to it, more of a flow with the increasing speed of the descending enemies and the music. It had a tune. It was simple, it was barely a beat, but it was there and it helped give Space Invaders a sense of growing urgency. It's something that just about every game in the arcades and at home would replicate soon. That and just about every other characteristic of it. Not to say that Space Invaders itself wasn't based on copying other games and being inspired by Breakout. This is how games worked and still do, usually based on previous ideas slightly improved, enhanced and endlessly iterated upon. Space Invaders was a massive success that dwarfed any singular other game before it and would still be a colossus in the market for years to come. In just six months, Taito built and sold over a hundred thousand units for Japanese arcades alone, resulting in six hundred million dollars in revenue. And before the end of 1978, they had shipped close to 60,000 units to the US as well through Midway that also handled the European release. Space Invaders were so popular that arcades existed solely to cater to people that wanted to play it and it alone. It wasn't like in the old days where you just didn't have any other choice than Pong. It was simply a really engaging game that everyone wanted to play. And soon it would be ripped off wholesale by many, many other arcade game makers. SNK turned itself into a gaming-oriented company this year, noticing the extreme profitability of arcade games. It was also in this age that Nintendo made a big entrance in the video game market. Sure, it was technically in it before, but in 1978 it released both an arcade game, an adaptation of Reversi, as well as various editions of the Color TV game, a home console that was on the same level as the previous generation of the Magnavox Odyssey. Speaking of which, the Odyssey entered its second generation, with a new console that came equipped with a keyboard, cartridge games and an Intel 8048 CPU. A somewhat more powerful processor than what the competition had, but not by much. Let's face it, this wasn't an Intel 8086, which by coincidence was released that very same year. The processor responsible for the x86 architecture and for just about every computer we have now in our homes. With one slight glorious exception, and well, the power PC architecture that Apple clung to, it would become the only architecture available for the general public, bringing with it guaranteed backwards compatibility for decades, as well as inefficiency and limitations in other areas. The recent advancements in computing technology were joined by the development of new storage mediums, such as Laserdisc, that would make its way to arcades in just a few years, offering a level of visual fidelity that could only be matched by movies, because they were movies. The first trial of a cellular network began this year when Bell Lab set up the first towers in Chicago, ushering in a future where you will never be able to rid yourself of getting called by other people or social media. And it can be said in some way that that also began in 1978, because the first public bulletin board system that was set up by Ward Christensen and Randy Seuss also went online that very same year as a result of them getting snowed in during the great blizzard of Chicago and getting bored. In other parts of the world, however, the weather didn't result in things as positive as the first BBS that ordinary people could access. A monsoon left 2 million homeless in India 
and an earthquake left tens of thousands dead in Iran. After all, what would this show be if I were not to remind you of the horrors that other people faced and inserting the odd tidbit like this being the year that the Volkswagen Beetle ended production in Germany. And while there are many, many, many other games made this year, there's only one more that truly needs to be discussed. At the University of Essex, two men, named Roy Trubshaw and Richard Bartle, enamored with Zork, back when it was called Dungeon, decided to create something new, something different, something called Mud One, multi-user dungeon, the first of its kind. And it wasn't about killing monsters, exploring caves, collecting loot or shooting space weasels, though some of those did factor in it. Mud One was meant more of as a journey of self-discovery, where you would enter a world filled with many, many other people and your mission was to ascend to the rank of wizard, being granted immortality and get the basic the keys to the kingdom. Most importantly, you enter this world as yourself, as who you wanted to be, not as how others wanted you to be. Not as a product of a very restrictive society built with very specific social classes in mind from which there was very little chance of escaping. It was a game made to enlighten people, to show them that they have within them the ability to improve themselves and the world around them. You would go into this world, you would make friends, you would discuss things, you would be free to experiment with who you are, to achieve the goal of becoming that wizard, that all-powerful being, and then going back to the real world knowing that you still have that power of achieving your goal, of improving yourself. It is also the predecessor of every MMO in existence, but that's only because everybody else missed the point. This multi-user dungeon, this first virtual world that existed independently of any one of its users but relied upon them to develop, was also the first game to be accessible via the internet once the university was connected to ARPANET several years later. There would be many other things to say about Mud 1, and I have said them, this is why I encourage you to go watch a show called Corrupting an Ideal the Dark Age of the MMO. You'll get the long version of the story. And with so much praise, you'd think that Mud 1 would be the game of 1978. And while it is a groundbreaking game, with a message of hope that has still eluded many game developers, I've got to give it to Space Invaders. Mud 1 meant a lot to a few people, but Space Invaders turned gaming into a financial juggernaut, pushing the industry into the multi-billion dollar segment and bringing video games into the spotlight like never before. And to this day, Space Invaders is a staple of gaming culture. It is ingrained in the global consciousness in a way that few games are, especially games from that age. That is why Space Invaders is the game of 1978. So come back next time when the journey continues and we reach new heights. Goodbye.